morning to you all. I am delighted to be able to introduce Dr. Doug Priest to you on the second day of his lecture series. Now, first let me say about Doug that he is an MK, a missionary kid, and he turned out okay. <laughs> pretty good, in fact. He turned out pretty good. And since my boys both grew up as missionary kids, knowing Doug gives Linda and me some hope. So, <laughs> Doug, of course, is also a graduate of Northwest Christian College, now Northwest Christian University, as are Linda and I, and uh, Roy Lawson, and Dan Lawson. Doug preceded me there by just a few years, but we were both there during an era when NCC was sending many of its graduates every year, both to Emmanuel and to CMF, and many times to CMF via Emmanuel. Uh, NCC, of course, is where Donald McGavran started his School of World Mission. The school gave him all the spare space that they had, which was a little tiny area on the third floor of the library. And then Fuller called and said they'd given him an entire school, so off he went. But his legacy at NCC was a strong connection to World Mission, and that was passed on to those of us that were students at the time. For those of us who came through NCC at that time, the church's mission was core to the church's identity. Now, if you're a missions professor, one of the main websites you will turn to frequently is called the William Carey Library, www.missionbooks.org. I was on there a few weeks back looking for some books, and as soon as the website came up, there was Doug staring at me through my computer screen. Doug is the editor of the Alan R. Tippett series, which is now, what, about five books strong? Is that what it is? Uh, Tippett was one of Doug's professors at Fuller and was also one of the 20th century's premier missiologists in North America. Many of his works were never published, so Doug's been busy for several years correcting that problem. I remember he, uh, he contacting me by email. He was trying to track down journal articles. He had the title. He didn't have the journal. He didn't have the edition. So, so I would just get onto our, our library website, type in the title, and all the information would come up, and I'd email it back, and he thought I was a genius <laughs> until he found out that I was cheating. So that was... Finally, if you are ever fortunate enough to be a guest in Doug's and Robin's home, you need to visit his office because it has one of the most extensive mission libraries I've ever seen in my life. Uh, Doug loves books. Doug loves the mission of the church. His office is a testimony to that which he loves. I'll, I'll um, say a prayer and then we'll invite Doug to come forward. Father, your mission is a great one, and, and we are amazed at the creativity with which your people approach your mission all the time. And this issue of short-term missions is full of complexities, complexities that require great wisdom on our part and your guidance on our part if we're going to go about it well. So we thank you for Doug, for his research, for his heart, and for what he will share with us today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Doug. Uh, yesterday, I mentioned that I have a bibliography uh, of references cited, and uh, I've left that bibliography over here in the corner if anybody wants to grab one of those. May I begin with a personal comment? Right now, I mean exactly right now, our daughter, Nicole Priest Caesar, is in the middle of the defense of her PhD at Temple University. The defense began at 10.30. Her area is post-colonial literature. Nicole likes to say that when she married Greg Caesar, it was a coming together of church and state. Yesterday, we provided an introductory overview of short-term missions, trying to be objective in noting the positives and the negative values of short-term missions. We commented that the early literature on short-term missions was positive if examined from the point of view of those who went on short-term trips, if examined by those who promote short-term trips, as would be expected, 
and if examined by some missionaries and local believers who see short-term trips as a means of getting support and who have been helped by those who participate in these trips. On the other hand, there was a body of literature written by those who opposed short-term missions. Their opposition may have come from having a vested interest in keeping the system the way it always had been. Their opposition may have come from sound reasoning, such as how can somebody evangelize one whose language one does not speak? Or how can you really love your neighbor just passing through? About a decade ago, a new strand in the literature on short-term missions began to emerge. There had been enough years that had passed with people participating in short-term trips that credible longitudinal studies could be undertaken. Research on short-term missions began to find its way into theses and dissertations. Professors of mission began to focus their research on the phenomena and their results were published. And it's to those studies that we now turn for this second lecture in our series. Much of the initial research in short-term missions relied on questionnaires and results were in the forms of statistics. Barna found that while most people take service trips outside of the country, 33% of short-term mission trips were to locations in the United States. A person does not have to go far in order to grow personally through serving others. People that took domestic service trips reported the same degree of life-changing experiences as did those who traveled abroad. The typical person who has been on a mission trip had taken two such journeys. Robert and Joseph Priest recently surveyed 48 colleges and seminaries with surveys given out to students. Their survey resulted in a total sample of 5,720. They found that 51% of the students had been on short-term mission trips. The median cost of these trips was just over $1,400. In terms of where the short-term mission trips took place, in Latino America, Mexico is clearly the number one destination. In South America, Peru and Ecuador are the number one destinations, with Brazil following, and then Bolivia. In Africa, Kenya and South Africa are the destinations of choice. In Asia, the most frequent destination is China, followed by Thailand and then India. In Europe, the United Kingdom of Great Britain is visited most frequently, followed by Romania, Germany, and Russia. A few years ago, K.S. Park interviewed 869 undergraduate students from Moody Bible Institute, Columbia International University, and to Coal Falls Christian College and Nyack College. Freshmen were the largest group who filled out the survey, but we shouldn't be surprised by that because freshmen are compliant when they first get to campus. <laughs> Females represented 52% of the total. 75% of these students had gone on at least one short-term mission trip. Note that this is 75 times the rate at which American undergraduate students travel outside of the USA in the context of study abroad programs. Many of the students had taken multiple trips with a high of 20 trips taken by one student who we can call a short-term junkie. <laughs> As one pastor Riley observed, the assumption is that people go overseas, fall in love with the project, and become cheerleaders for it. But often there is a breakdown, and what they become cheerleaders for is raising support for their next short-term mission trip. Having been on the receiving end of short-term mission trip funding letters from the same people time after time, I see the pastor's point. Of course, I cannot be too critical because I too receive funds from generous donors. Park went on to add, 41% of the students had spent one month or less abroad, 23% two months or less, and another 23% four months or less. Only 3.6% spent close to a year, and only 1.7% of those interviewed spent between one and three years. Now remember, they're just freshmen in college mainly, so they 
probably couldn't have spent three years because it means they would have missed high school. This represents a paradigm shift in how today's church in the U.S. perceives mission. The paradigm shift has made it essential for the advocates of short-term missions not only to redefine, but also to attempt to exegete biblical narratives in defense of what could constitute short-term missions, such as demonstrated in the 2003 book by Peterson entitled Maximum Impact Short-Term Mission. But it's the subtitle of that book that really catches our attention. Maximum Impact Short-Term Mission, The God Commanded, Repetitive redeployment of swift, temporary, non-professional missionaries. <laughs> Scott Moreau of Wheaton College did a study of mission agencies drawing on annual data between 2001 and 2005 coming from the Mission Handbook. The Mission Handbook is a reference book, comes out every three years. It's a directory of U.S. and Canadian Protestant missionaries, mission agencies working overseas. And here are some of the findings that he found noteworthy. From 2001 to 2005, the number of long-term missionaries decreased, as did the number of middle-term missionaries, that is, those who serve from one through four years. In those years, a large Larger percentage of all short-term workers went with agencies whose primary activities related to relief and development or education and training, and a smaller percentage went with agencies whose primary activities were focused on evangelism and discipleship. Regarding mission agencies, the total number of support staff for short-term missions has grown by almost 218% since 1996, with full-time support staff increasing by almost 325%. Agencies are putting more and more of their resources into ensuring that short-term missionaries are adequately supported. Mission agencies are more actively recruiting for short-term trips than ever before and using a variety of contact methods in their mobilization efforts. Finally, U.S. agencies are putting significant resources into mobilizing and administering short-term efforts. Now get this, even though there is no corresponding increase in long-term missionaries seen yet as a result of these efforts. Let me use a personal example. Soon after I became the director of CMF, I was on a college campus trying to recruit students uh, to our mission, hoping to find some that would be interested in working with us. A young woman came up to me and shared her desire to be involved in missions. She wanted to work with an agency and lead short-term mission trips. Her vision caught me totally off guard because I had never even thought of having a staff member at CMF whose job was to lead short-term mission trips. I was speechless and I'm sure my nonverbal reaction was not what she had been hoping for. But what has happened at CMF in the intervening years? We now have three and a half full-time staff persons who focus on recruiting short-term missionaries. Our one position we have, we've had for over 20 years, focuses on our summer internship program called REACH. Some of you have been on that summer internship program. Some of you have hosted REACH interns. The second position is one we've had for 10 years, and its focus is on recruiting exchange students for our International Campus Ministry Global Scope teams. The third position is one that until a, until a few years ago was a shared position, but now it's full time. We call this our Reveal program, and it's focused primarily on student internships, short-term trips of usually three or four months for recent graduates or for students whose major requires an international internship. The half position is really a full-time position that processes applications, but from both short-term applicants and long-term applicants. Now, our hope with all of these positions is that those who participate will want to come back again and do it over and will come back for a longer term the next time around. And how has this affected our long-term missionary numbers? If by long-term we mean people who have stayed on the field at least two years, we used to define long-term as somebody who stayed on the field 20 years, now we define it as somebody who stays on the field two years or longer. Uh, some of our missionaries have stayed 30 years, 
But our numbers have pretty much held the same over the last 15 years. About seven years ago, after I'd been the director of CMF for 12 years, I did some number crunching. I studied the numbers of the two preceding successive six-year periods, compared them to one another. I was looking at the number of missionaries we had on the field at the end of each calendar year, and then I compared the two six-year periods together. I found that our missionaries had not risen much, the number of our missionaries in the calendar year, much in those 12 years. But in the second period of our study, I found that we had affiliated four times the number of missionary recruits as we had in the first six years. What that showed, in addition to our staff having to work a lot harder to keep the number of long-term missionaries on the field, was that more and more people were signing on with CMF, but for shorter and shorter periods. Basically, Moreau's findings for mission agencies line up with where we are, have been at CMF for the last 15 years. Well, now let's move from statistical studies into more specific studies. The numerical studies are helpful to get an idea of what's happening in general, but we now need to get into studies of specific issues. By way of introduction and summary, a growing number of researchers question the long-term impact of short-term trips upon participants. Some studies demonstrate that while participants come home with lofty aspirations of buying less, praying more, sharing Christ more, within six to eight weeks, most resort back to the same assumptions and behaviors that they had prior to the trip. Others are even more critical. David McClure contends that not only do these trips fail to bring about life-lasting change for the participants, worse yet, they actually perpetuate the very things they're intended to counter. Participants come home assuming poor people are doing just fine and they're happy the way they are. Trip goers come home concluding that non-Western countries are backward given their supposedly chaotic road systems and archaic ways of doing construction. Instead of advancing the cause of missions, the exercise simply reinforces worn stereotypes and old power relations. While the life-changing impact of these trips upon the nationals is used as a way to motivate people to support the trips, there has been little research conducted to explore whether or not short-term trips really help the cause of the global church as much as we think. In 2006, Kurt Verbeek studied nearly 200 North Americans who came to Honduras after Hurricane Mitch to build houses. He found that these short-term trips had resulted in very little lasting positive change in either the lives of the North Americans or the Hondurans. Verbeek was curious if his study was an exception or if it was supported by other research. He found 13 other quantitative studies of short-term missions which used some sort of independent measure to corroborate the changes in participants' lives. The review of these studies demonstrates that 11 of the 13 studies found little or no significant positive impact from the short-term missions trip in the lives of the participants. Of the 14 studies, his was the only one that looked of the, at the impact of the trip on the recipient churches and communities. He goes on to make a very key point. While short-term missions as currently practiced may seldom result in lasting positive change, the experience can be structured to become a catalyst for change. Research demonstrates that lasting positive change is possible, but it requires that the participants are held accountable and are encouraged to translate their good intentions into long-lasting actions. Here are some of the highlights of Verbeek's research. Nearly all quantitative studies of short-term missions have been done since 1990. Two of the studies conducted by Robert Priest of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School did not find that people who had participated in more short-term trips ever gave more money to missions, were less materialistic, or had more inter-ethnic friendships. Two of the 13 studies showed significant positive change in the participants. Though participants indicate change, the results do not show the perceived changes. 
This may be due to ineffective instruments to measure the change or the self-perception of the change was greater than the actual change in their lives. Verbeek finds it distressing that only two of 44 short-term mission studies to date indicate data on those who received short-term missions. In other words, the studies focus on those who go, not to whom they go. Focusing on those who receive short-term mission teams is a key research topic for a future study worthy of a master's thesis and much more involved than sending a questionnaire to a few Christian colleges. The short-term researchers might actually have to go on some long-term research trips. The two factors that are key in helping people bring about positive change in their lives are accountability and encouragement. Individuals are mo more motivated and will work harder to achieve their goals, A, if their goals are made public, B, their goals are specific, not just something like, do your best, and C, if the goals are more demanding as long as it is within the individual's capacity. It matters little if the individuals set their own goals or if the goals are set for them as long as they commit to the logic and importance of the goal. Goal setting theory would argue that in short-term missions, participants are much more likely to successfully experience lasting positive change in their lives if they set specific, public, and demanding goals and then are regularly held accountable for their progress. Social networks do provide the challenges of accountability and public pressure to achieve outcomes, and they also provide encouragement, understanding, friendship. They provide positive social relationships which provide the motivation to do things we do not do on our own, which is why I am a member of Weight Watchers. <laughs> I now want to mention an article for those of you involved in short-term missions from the church or from a mission agency or even from a school or seminary to ponder. This is the sort of thing that would not often be considered, but it's very important. Michelle Walker Adams and Scott Ross presented a paper to a short-term missions conference sponsored by the Evangelical Missiological Society, the results of which ended up in a book that I've used for these lectures. That book is edited by Robert Priest, again, no relation, and entitled, Effective Engagement in Short-Term Missions, Doing It Right. The article to which I direct your attention is Short-Term Missions, Avoiding Liability Pitfalls. You've probably heard, I don't think it's an urban myth, that one of the growing areas in law practice is the bringing of suits against nonprofit organizations. Seemingly, the churches are being targeted, as are schools, mission agencies, and the whole host of nonprofit organizations. Some of us are admittedly easy targets. Every church or mission agency or school that is considering involving itself in short-term missions should read this chapter as a matter of stewardship and due diligence. Nobody wants to be negligent. Many short-term mission teams involve an element of construction. In fact, as we saw yesterday, that is the number one activity of short-term mission trips, building and construction projects. Premises liability is probably the most common area of exposure for agencies. Churches and mission agencies frequently use volunteer labor for construction projects at home and worldwide in building churches, schools, airstrips, medical clinics, and other things. That volunteer labor, even when formed from the congregation and in a spirit of collaboration on a religious project, can result in lawsuits when accidents occur. The laws of premises liability may be particularly relevant as short-term mission teams travel to churches and schools in other countries, going either to aid in construction or to help out in some other capacity. Gone are the days of charitable immunity from premises liability. The fact that a charity would be financially destroyed will not prevent a court's finding of liability against it. In Fernquist versus the San Francisco Presbytery, the fall of a volunteer construction worker was attributed to improperly placed rafters. The court held that whether the organization gave improper instruction or one of the other workers had improperly performed the work, in either case, 
the organization was negligent. In today's litigious society, there are plenty of people out there who would love to find somebody who is injured on a short-term mission trip and bring a case against the church, agency, school, or whoever else they can think of. This happens with regularity. It's the unseen side of short-term missions, and I know of a case going on right now involving people from the Stone Campbell movement. An overweight student, a legal adult at the time, was working on helping to convert an old bowling alley into a community center following Hurricane Katrina. He had been sent with a group from his church, and the church was linked up with a mission agency in the area doing the work. Markers had been put up on the roof that showed where people should not walk, and as I understand it, his own mother had told him he should not be on any roof due to his body size. You can guess exactly what happened. He went right up on the roof, walked right past the warning, and fell through. A suit was brought against the mission agency and the church who sent the short-term team. While the church tried to find a way that they could help the young man with his medical costs and avoid a lawsuit, that proved impossible. The case has not yet been settled. Friends, if we're going to be involved in short-term missions, then let's be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Brian Howell is a professor of anthropology at Wheaton College. He's among the new generation of missionary anthropologists, which is, of course, my way of gently poking fun at Dr. Sweeney and myself, because we are now of the older generation of missionary anthropologists. Howell was aware of research being undertaken on short-term missions, and he decided to approach the subject in a new way. He determined to view the phenomena from an anthropological point of view. He had been struck as he listened to the similarities in narrative that he heard from those who had been on short-term trips. It seemed to him that regardless of age, regardless of location, and regardless of the length of the short-term trip, everybody said the same things about their trips. The comments were all the same, so he focused his study on those narratives. Now, those who've been on short-term trips they frame up their trips as significant, even life-altering experiences, largely in regard to personal, spiritual, and emotional growth, and often related through one or two significant relationships, divine revelations, or meaningful encounters. Many of you have been on short-term trips. Many of you have listened to those who have returned from short-term trips. Can you recall saying and hearing these sorts of comments? I'll never be the same. My prayer life has been totally radicalized. Those people have nothing, but they're so happy. I'm going to start a program to raise money to get those kids shoes and socks. My church just doesn't get it. They could be helping so many people, but they just focus on the upcoming Christmas pageant. I can't wait to get back. I developed a really strong bond with little Anopheles. He couldn't understand me, but he smiled every time he saw me coming with a piece of candy. He sucked the life right out of me. We really connected. <laughs> Short-term mission travels are cultural events embedded into historic, linguistic, and institutional context through which we come to participate in and, in some ways, construct our travel experience before anybody gets on the plane. Our narratives, in a very real sense, construct our reality. In layman's terms, we convince ourselves, or even, we deceive ourselves. For all the variation in short-term missions, there is a very common structure to the experience, a tripartite narrative moving from pre-trip, through the trip, and to the post-trip stage. Through shared narratives, culturally or individually specific experiences are made intelligible to self and others. The meaning emerging from these short-term mission narratives partly fits the narrative structure of pilgrimage, in which those traveling encountered a kind of spiritual awakening through an encounter with spiritual power out there. Instead of traveling to a particular shrine, the poor become a place where short-term mission pilgrims experience true community with each other and receive blessing from God through their interaction with culturally different others. 
But unlike narratives of pilgrimage, this spiritual experience is not thought to come from the hardship of the journey or the power of the shrine, but through the self-sacrificial giving and humble receiving that is expected to take place when wealthy North Americans give themselves to the poor and come to recognize their own bondage to wealth. The guiding short-term mission narrative suggests that encounters with need not only reveal truth about the world, but also transform those who engage in it. Success to the short-term participant is not in addressing poverty, but in rendering service to the poor and returning changed as a result. Some short-term narratives are constructed in tourist terms, a sort of modernized Julius Caesar Vini Vidi Vici. We came, we saw, we conquered, now let's move on to the next port of call. Hence, the short-term mission narratives often include references to the food, the water, the illnesses, the traffic, the sanitation facilities or lack thereof, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the cultural shops, and of course the shopping, especially if it involved bargaining. Where the tourist, like the pilgrim, finds inner transformation through introspection, education, and a quest for personal growth, the short-term mission traveler looks to be transformed through service humbly and sincerely given and through the relationships that result. In the end, however, although it shares aspects of tourism and pilgrimage, short-term missions cannot be reduced to another version of either of these. Guided by theological commitments and embedded in a wider social context, short-term missions is a type of travel unto itself in which particular guiding narratives shape the experiences of the participants. Despite the commonalities of narratives, are the short-term mission participants really changed? Some authors have found that short-term mission travelers project or imagine the lives and relationships of those to whom they minister and often come away with romantic or unsubstantiated impressions of poverty and the faith of the non-Christian other. Even more critical voices argue that these trips invariably reproduce the power inequalities, negative stereotypes, and the romantic illusions with which the travelers began. The juxtaposition of the good done for others and the benefits to ourselves remains a source of tension in the language and motivation of short-term mission. Concerning a short-term mission trip to an urban area overseas, Richardson wrote about the students coming back to the States. Since behaviors didn't change, how could students claim in their narratives that their lives had so radically changed through their involvement in an urban mission experience? Apparently, students who claim changed lives are really talking about changed perceptions, attitudes, and feelings, and not about changed behavior. Howells comes to this conclusion regarding his research on the narratives of those preparing to go and those who have returned. To the extent that short-term mission travel is meant to create lasting change for those travelers as well as accomplishing good purposes in line with an orthodox understanding of mission, those sending short-term teams must consider reform in light of the larger economic, institutional, and cultural context of their travel narrative. But we must not get ahead of ourselves, for that's the subject of tomorrow's lecture. Robert Priest, along with his students and colleagues, have probably done more study on short-term missions than any other single researcher. Much of Priest's research has already been alluded to in our lectures, so I'm going to focus specifically on Priest's comments about short-term missions and the academy, or the missiological community. Robert Priest is the current president of the American Society of Missiology, and he notes that the divide between grassroots ministry practices of local churches and what is happening in the academy has perhaps nowhere been greater than in the area of short-term missions. Indeed, it is this glaring divide that I believe led the sponsors of this very series to focus on the subject of short-term missions. Like many with long-time involvement in missions, Priest was not enamored with the short-term mission experience. He wrote, there's a marked divide between scholars and practitioners between missiology and short-term mission. 
We have not systematically researched it, have not produced high quality missiological analyses of short term mission structures, have not oriented our writing or teaching to the large number of our students whose connection to the mission field and the global church is through short term missions. Short-term mission leaders often avoid missiology, and missiologists avoid short-term mission. Then Priest went on into the confessional. It dawned on me that my adversarial stand on short-term mission might be pedagogically counterproductive and might be one contributor to the marginalization of missiology within seminary education. Indeed, I began to wonder if a more constructive relationship by missiologists to the short-term mission movement might have distinct pedagogical and missiological advantages. Is it possible, he asks, that short-term missions can actually complement the work of long-term missions in reaching the number of unreached and planting new churches in the field? Can we learn anything from this army of amateurs that has become a major force in missions today? His article then follows with six pedagogical suggestions which might be something for Milligan College and Emmanuel Christian Seminary to consider. These suggestions are, number one, missiologists must place short-term mission movement at the center of research, theorizing, and writing. Number two, Many seminaries and colleges have one course in mission required of all students. Much of the content of this course should be related to short-term mission. How would this work? Yesterday we indicated that one problem we Americans have in going overseas is our paternalism. Neither missiological education nor short-term mission experience by themselves are strongly predictive of lowered rates of paternalism. But when both are combined, the rates of paternalism are significantly lowered. Those with both short-term mission experience and mission intercultural studies are significantly less paternalistic than those without either or than those with only short-term mission experience. Number three, every seminary with a missiologist on the faculty should develop a course on short-term mission. Short-term mission experience as currently practiced is not leading the participants to value cross-cultural training or missiological education. We might well ask whether leaders of short-term mission trips are themselves designing these experiences in ways which give the illusion of simple and impressive results. These might buffer people from the reality of culture which, and fail to help people grapple with the profound economic disparities they encounter. Number four, our engagement with short-term mission must be positive and constructive, not adversarial. Perhaps Emmanuel could host a training course for those mission agencies and churches who focuses a lot of effort on short-term mission trips. Invite those people to a conference to present papers. Some of you present papers. Engage in a mutually informative dialogue from which each group benefits. Number five, if a seminary or college requires a cross-cultural learning component, missiologists must help shape the requirements and lobby against credit being given for short-term mission service where short-term mission service is disconnected from missiological learning. Of course, this requirement is more appropriate for the undergraduate institution than for the seminary. But in our audience today, maybe there are some who have influence at the undergraduate level as well. Number six, help students realize that there are whole arenas of life and whole fields of knowledge that their short-term mission experience must be related to. What an important advantage it would be to the participant if they could be guided in relating their short-term experience to economics, historical factors, geopolitical realities, theological issues like justice and ethics, and spiritual formation across cultures. There's a lot can be done. For, exa for example, when somebody comes back from the slums of Nairobi, Kenya, somebody could sit down with that person and say, what did you think of that? The person would respond, the people are very poor there. Why do you say they're very poor? Well, they didn't have anything. So you're saying that poverty is equated with lack of material possessions. Is that really true? 
Is there, are there other definitions of poverty? Anyway, back to Nairobi. So why do you say that they, that they were poor? Why are they poor? Well, uh, it seemed like, I guess, they didn't have jobs. Well, why don't they have jobs? Why didn't the people have jobs? Well, I guess in Kenya, there aren't that many jobs for people to have. Why aren't there jobs in Kenya for people to have? Well, I don't know. Well, here's some things that we could think about to answer that question of why the people in Kenya don't have jobs. Why are they poor? Well, I saw that they, I saw that they were eating uh, maize meal. And where did that maize meal come from? Well, I guess it's grown locally. Yes, it's grown locally. Uh, couldn't they export some of that maize meal? Well, not really, because some of the Western countries put such a high tariff on importing food from other countries that they won't make any money importing food. And yet, we subsidize our farmers so that they can produce corn at a reduced rate. Is that just? So you can imagine what kinds, of, what kinds of discussion can take place after somebody comes back from a short-term trip that can, that can constructively help them understand and process what they've seen and what they've been through on a trip. But I'm telling you, that doesn't happen with most people who go on short-term trips. How do they have the equipment to process what's going on? In fact, maybe Emmanuel should come up with a recruitment campaign Come to Emmanuel and let us join with you to put your short-term mission experience into perspective. Then go out and change the world. That might just preach. We have any questions for Doug? We can answer today instead of tomorrow. Who is it that determines what the needs are there? 
I hate to say this because I said it so many times yesterday, and if even people started laughing about it when I answered it, but I really am going to talk about that tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> tomorrow. You were asking me, you were asking me yesterday, Dr. Lolia, about uh, what do people on the receiving end think of these short-term trips, and have there been studies that have been done? And I told you I'll talk about that today, and I did. I did. Two out of forty-four studies are all that focused on what happens on the other end. Uh, but I will talk about that, I promise. I promise tomorrow. It's on tape. All right. Paul. Okay. Paul, uh, you raised the, the issue of you know, how people process this experience when they've been on a short term mission trip. And I, I remember this um, years ago when, when we had students who first started to go to the travel some of our trips who would come back and suddenly they were Israel bad, Palestine good. You know, their whole world would change. Now the good thing about that was they really began to engage with the needs of Palestinians and understand the realities of the Romans. But sometimes it was, if I just posture myself correctly on this issue, I will satisfactorily process my experience. Is it where the posturing becomes then the way you appropriate your experience, you know, and you know, so what is what what is a valid process of, of mission experience, a short term mission experience? Is you you've engaged people on the ground in uh, a country that does know what poverty is, <coughs> that that is facing incredible physical challenges, but you know you're not going to keep going back there year after year after year you know, and building wells or whatever, uh, what should be the, the appropriate process? <coughs> the question has to do with you, you, you go to a, a field and you, you have your experiences there, what should be the appropriate way to process that other than just to, to adapt a new position uh, regarding what's happening over there? Uh, I think the uh, processing of the trip has to take place at many different levels and over a period of time. The worst possible thing is to do no processing at all and just let the person <coughs> do it themselves. I mean, that's one way of processing the trip, and it's an important way, but it, it's not the best way. There sh should be that combined with other ways. Those who go on the trip should get together after the trip and talk about it, and they should share their perceptions of what happened, uh, compare that. They actually should be doing that while they're on the trip also maybe to meeting every day, talking about this is what I saw, this is how it affected me, did it affect you the same way, why was I affected that way? Uh, so they do that while they're on the trip, so debriefing when they get home from the trip, and then hopefully the leader, the leader of that trip, and this is a learning experience for leaders, it should be a learning moment for leaders, they need to be engaged with the people that go on that short-term mission trip on an individual as well as a group basis, extending into the future. And the church, this is an important need that doesn't really happen now, the church needs to know and provide opportunities for those people who come home from short-term trips to do something and get involved in something within, within six weeks of their coming back. They should have an option of things that these people can do, a menu of here's what you can do to help with your experience. Now that you've come back changed, why don't we <coughs> do this? Uh, and that's a good way of processing it because after, as, as uh, I mentioned in the statistics, after about six to eight weeks, the people who study have found that there's no change, no life change that continues on in the behavior of those who've gone on the trip. This guys 
the two or three people who are writing and studying about this have internalized that, and because they have positions related to missiology or missions at their school, that very likely they are probably incorporated. So I would probably say um, uh, Wheaton, where Hal is, uh, Verbeek, I think, is at Calvin College, and, and Priest at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School are probably schools where they have <coughs> done practice what they preach. Okay, thank you, Todd, for another fine lecture.